warm welcome to our viewers here in Nigeria and around the world. We begin at the United Nations, where Secretary General Antonio Guterres should be in the Turkish capital, Istanbul, already having made an announcement during the week about his visit. Mr. Guterres will be overseeing the signing of a deal on Black Sea grains exports between Russia and Ukraine. A Turkish Foreign Minister, Mevlut Cavusoglu, said yesterday he was hopeful about reaching a deal and the talks were going well. Ankara says a general agreement was reached on a UN-led plan during talks in Istanbul last week and that it wants to put this in writing this week. Before last week's talks, diplomats said details of the plan included Ukrainian vessels guiding grain ships in and out through mined port waters. Russia agreed to a truce while shipments move. And Turkey, supported by the United Nations, inspecting ships to allay Russian fears of weapons smuggling. The United Nations and Turkey have been working for two months to broker what UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres calls a package deal to resume Ukraine's Black Sea grain exports and to facilitate Russia's grain and fertilizer shipments. Secretary General Antonio Guterres will travel to Istanbul, Turkey, this evening as part of his efforts to ensure full global access to Ukraine's food products and Russian food and fertilizer. And what is at stake with regard to this deal? What we're trying to do is have an agreement that would allow for uh, Ukrainian and Russian uh, of food and fertilizer to reach global markets. As you know, we've pointed out uh, for many months how serious the, the food crisis around the world is. And this is a component, a large component of that, uh, that crisis. So if we can resolve this, we can potentially uh, save uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of people from having food be priced out of their reach. Uh, so that is part of that, if there's an agreement. But uh, as the Secretary General pointed out, uh, the aim for all the parties in these discussions, not just an agreement between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, but an agreement for the world. And, and, uh, and he, as the Secretary General has pointed out, he has uh, had two different uh, key UN officials, Martin Griffiths and Rebecca Greenspan, uh, involved in different tracks uh, in terms of dealing with issues around uh, these topics. One man really looking forward to the deal signing today is President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine, who said as of yesterday he was expecting news about the unblocking of the country's Black Sea ports. Russia and Ukraine are both major global wheat suppliers, but Moscow's February 24th invasion of its neighbor has sent food prices soaring and stoked an international food crisis. A war has stalled Kyiv's exports, leaving dozens of ships stranded and some 20 million tons of grain stuck in silos at Odessa port. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan says on Thursday, said on Thursday a deal would be signed today between Ukraine, Russia, Turkey and the UN to resume grain shipments. In his nightly address, President Zelensky also updated the latest on Russia's military offensive, saying Russia had deployed Uragan and Iskander missiles, adding each of these Russian strikes is an argument for Ukraine to receive more high mass, a high mass are a type of US long range missiles. We expect news from our state, from Turkey, regarding the unblocking of our ports. The Russian army again shelled the Saltivka district of Kharkiv with rocket artillery, civilian objects only, a residential building, trade pavilion, public transport. As of now, three people are known to have been killed and more than 20 people are on the list of wounded. The occupiers also shelled the Stavyansk community in Donbass with Eurogans and hit Kamatas with Iskanders. And each of these Russian strikes is an argument for Ukraine to receive more HIMARS and other modern and effective weapons. Each of these strikes only strengthens our desire to defeat the occupiers. It will certainly happen. The existing potential for all forms of Russian aggression will also be exhausted, particularly for offensive actions on the front and terror against our cities. We will do everything to speed it up. And this is exactly what we emphasize in all contacts with our partners. We discuss the current situation on the front line around Ukraine, we set our task in several tactical directions to strengthen our positions. 
and very thoroughly the matter of supplying the latest weapons to our troops. The intensity of attacks on the enemy still needs to be increased. The participants of the Stavka meeting agreed that our forces have a strong potential to advance on the battlefield and inflict new significant losses to the occupiers. In the meantime, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says his country will deliver on promises to deliver food, fertilizer, energy and other commodities to its African friends despite the difficulties created by Western sanctions. He made the comment recently saying we are well aware of the importance of Russian supplies of socially important commodities including food to many countries around the world. We are mindful that these supplies play an important role in, the preserving, in preserving social stability. Ukraine has accused Moscow of blockading Ukrainian ports in the Black Sea and not allowing an estimated 20 million tons of grain to be shipped to customers around the world. Russia has repeatedly pointed out that the ports have been mined by Ukrainian government forces and that the Russian Navy has offered to safely escort all grain ships. The US and its allies have said that their embargo against Russia in the name of supporting Ukraine does not apply to grain and fertilizers. However, as Lavrov pointed out in an interview with uh, Russia Today and uh, Sputnik earlier this week, sanctions have denied insurance to Russian ships while blocking foreign vessels from Russian ports, effectively cutting off supplies to Africa by sea. Lavrov said Western sanctions have further exacerbated negative trends in global commodity markets that began during the COVID-19 pandemic when the collective West flooded them with freshly printed money. Turning to Japan now, as the country's defense ministry says it is alarmed at fresh threats from Russia and has growing worries about Taiwan as a way significant increase in military spending. In an annual defense report, Tokyo said Russia's invasion of Ukraine risks sending the message that an attempt to unilaterally change the status quo by force is acceptable. It also warned Moscow may increasingly lean on its nuclear capacity as a deterrence, which could in turn mean an uptick in activity around Japan, where Russian nuclear submarines are routinely active. Remember Mariupol fighting for control of this strategic Ukrainian port city ended two months ago with victory for Russia. After thousands were killed and hundreds of thousands forced to flee, many of them who left the city, who were left in the city, now face a new battle, which is how to survive, according to many of the residents who were spoken to. A struggle for this once bustling city of 430,000 people on the shores of the Sea of Azov left it pulverized and with an estimated population in the tens of thousands. Many residents say they're struggling to get by despite efforts by the Russian installed administrators to try to rebuild. The United Nations says 90% of Mariupol's buildings were destroyed after Russia used tanks, artillery and airstrikes to try to dislodge its defenders. A top official from the world body said last month that at least 1,348 civilians had been killed, including 70 children. And the final toll was probably thousands higher. Kiev estimates that 22,000 civilians were killed. Russia's defense ministry has not responded to the report on the death toll, but has previously accused the city's Ukrainian defenders of using civilians as human shields and of setting up fire points in residential areas. Mariupol is in Ukraine's industrial Donetsk region. Moscow says it wants to take full control of the city in order to ensure its own security against NATO and to protect Russian speakers that accuses Kyiv of persecuting. Kyiv has denied this, of course, uh, that these speakers, Russian speakers, that is, have been persecuted. It says the allegation is a basis pretext for an imperial-style war of aggression. It also said it intends to take Mariupol back. Meanwhile, two districts of Ukraine's eastern city of Kharkiv were shelled by the Russian forces on Thursday, leaving three people dead and 23 more injured. According to the statement posted by the regional prosecutor's office, a public transport stop near the market in the northeast of the city was shelled at 9.30 a.m. local time. The three people, of course, were killed, as we mentioned, and 20 more were wounded there. 
uh, this footage we're looking at shows women, a woman bending over the dead body of her husband and crying as a few people try to comfort her. Uh, on Wednesday, a 13-year-old boy was killed by a Russian missile strike just outside a mosque uh, at a bus station. Kharkiv, Ukraine's second biggest city, resisted a Russian assault that reaches outskirts in the first two months of the invasion, but has experienced almost daily shelling over the past month after a period of relative calm. Russia's defense ministry says its forces have shot down a Ukrainian Su-25 aeroplane near the city of Kramatorsk in the Donetsk region as Moscow steps up its military operation. In a daily briefing, Defense Ministry spokesperson Igor Konashenko said Russian Aerospace Forces fighter jet has shot down a Su-25 aircraft of the Ukrainian Air Forces near Kramatorsk in the self-proclaimed People's Republic of Donetsk. Russian air defense systems have shot down a Mi-8 helicopter of the Ukrainian Air Forces near Pervomesk, Nikolai region. A Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson, Maria Zakharova, says there's been no contact with the United States over peace talks with Ukraine. She was addressing reporters on Thursday, saying the American administration forbids its team in Kiev to even think about talks with Russia and evidently forces them to fight to the last Ukrainian. Peace talks between Russia and Ukraine have been frozen since early April, when ceasefire talks brokered by Turkey in Istanbul collapsed. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has played down the prospect of peace talks while Russian troops still occupy Ukrainian territory. On Wednesday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that peace talks with Ukraine made no sense. Russia's defense, uh, Russia's President Vladimir Putin said on July 7, his country had not started anything yet in earnest in Ukraine and dared the West to try to defeat it on the battlefield. I want to bring in associate professor in the Department of International Relations at the Institute of Social Sciences, Odessa Lee Mechnikov, uh, National University in Romania, Sergei Glebyov. Thank you so much for speaking with us this morning. I, and I want to get, you know, your thoughts on, uh, first of all, the deal, the deal on grain exports is supposed to be signed this morning or today, sometime today. Uh, the only thing that Russia and Ukraine have agreed on since this war began. Would you consider the first step towards a peace process? Uh, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to take part uh, to your uh, morning program. So, uh, you know, it's really hard to estimate what uh, should be reached by all the parties involved uh, in the agreement as to the uh, grain export. Um, as soon as we have no any official text of the agreement uh, to analyze and to estimate it uh, far in advance. Uh, before the concrete steps on deblocking Ukrainian seaports uh, is uh, taking place. So I believe that we should wait until the official announcement of the conditions of this uh, deal between all involved parties. So this is the UN, this is Russian Federation, Turkey and Ukraine. So as far as we can see, um, the Ukrainian uh, side is pretty much skeptical as to the success of this uh, deal as soon as it was officially announced yesterday by the uh, Ukrainian power that the key um, condition for um, deblocking Ukrainian uh, seaports for the grain export is ensuring the is ensuring security of the Ukrainian territory on the south. And uh, we do understand that um, Russia is pretty much interested in approaching Ukrainian uh, sea ports of Odessa, uh, Yuzhny and Chernomorsk in order to proceed with their uh, military operation, as they say. The, uh, I do believe and I do think I'm pretty much skeptical about the success of the whole negotiation and uh, the whole story of deblocking. Uh, pretty skeptical uh, as soon as uh, Russia uh, pays no any attention and has taken no any 
uh, you know, um, has not taken any care about the people outside of the uh, um, of the rest of the world as to their uh, product needs, as to their food needs. The only thing Russia uh, takes care at the moment is to uh, fight against Ukraine and to get closer to the uh, seaport of Odessa, the main seaport uh, on the territory of Ukraine, which is more or less uh, is um, operating, uh, especially on the side of the Danube River. So uh, coming to the end of my thesis, I would like to stress out that Russia may uh, take these negotiations on the blocking as a cover to step close the, closer to the Ukrainian uh, seaports with their big uh, amphibious ships uh, to um, move forward with the invasion of the southern part of Ukraine. Uh, they had no chance to do this uh, for the last five months of the war, of the invasion, and now they are trying to use all the possible uh, factors, all the possible tools and instruments with the support of Turkey and the rest of the world to get closer to the uh, Ukrainian society. You, th you think that Russia had this in mind, you know, when um, the foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, says um, that Russia will still deliver the contractually promised food, fertilizer, energy, and other commodities, especially to African countries uh, where it's made these commitments? Uh, you know, um, the world uh, does not believe to any promises and any insurances and any guarantees from the side of the Russian Federation. This is uh, not the case of the diplomacy. This is the case of the uh, invasion. This is the case of the military operation. And all the means to proceed are good for the Russian Federation uh, to do so. Meaning that uh, they can promise a lot but they can guarantee nothing, and the rest of the world should not be hooked up on the Russian, let's say, promises, which are uh, part of the bluff, part of the blackmailing, and uh, frank lies. So I would rather think uh, that uh, uh, for, uh, for Turkey, for example, and for the President Erdogan, it's extremely important not to be hooked up and not to be playing the Russians uh, game in the whole story as soon as Turkey may be uh, seen and could be seen as someone who could be uh, mistreated and uh, actually gave up by the Russian uh, counterparts. So it's the very dangerous situation at the moment. And I don't think that we can get any uh, food security outside of this region rather than uh, escalation of the war from the side of the Russian Federation uh, near Odessa and the rest of the Ukrainian seaports, which are not occupied at the moment. What do you make of Turkey's role, you know, trying to play mediator between Ukraine and uh, Russia? Um, they want to appear neutral. They want to appear not taking any sides. But do you think they've already taken a side by their actions? I do believe that there is no any chance to take uh, no one's side uh, amid this situation in Ukraine and in general in the Black Sea region started not even uh, from 2014, starting from 2000. Uh, eight at least when the Russian Federation invaded Turkey, uh, invaded Georgia, and uh, there were uh, the there was a quite an alarming situation for the rest of the world to influence Russia and to try to somehow negotiate with Russia as to the uh, future security guarantees as to Ukraine, Georgia, and the rest countries of the uh, region. It was not done. It was not done after 2014, and uh, Turkey is trying to sit on the both uh, seats, on the both chairs, 
uh, being uh, the member state of the NATO, what is pretty much a uh, tricky for Turkey to be uh, the part of the organization which Russia treats as an enemy, basically, as the main threat of their uh, existence. And uh, this is not just about Turkey. This is basically about the political interests of uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, we do know that uh, he's pretty much uh, concerned about the um, role of NATO in the Black Sea region. Uh, he's trying to make uh, good deals with uh, Putin since uh, the beginning of the 21st century. And now he's trying to show the rest to the world, to the Russian Federation, to their uh, partners in NATO that Turkey does play a significant role in the Black Sea region. Turkey and Russia uh, were considered as central powers, regional powers, before 2014. And Turkey at the moment uh, cannot be the uh, regional power anymore in the situation when the Russian Federation controls and um, maintains uh, their position at the only regional power or the only military power in the in, in the region so uh, turkey's position and russia's position uh, in the region are not equal meaning that turkey lost its leadership in the region because uh, turkey can do nothing with the uh, russian uh, aggression and invasion into ukraine and for turkey uh, the only uh, way to support its significance in the the region is to play the role of the mediator between the Russian Federation and the rest of the world. And this mediation is pretty lucid to my mind because uh, there, there is a big danger that uh, President Erdogan, as I uh, said uh, previously, maybe played uh, not the Turkish role, not the role of the Turkish interest, but the role of the Putin's interest, which are still uh, threatening uh, Ukrainian territory and the southern parts of uh, of Ukraine. So uh, I do think that uh, uh, for uh, Erdogan, it's extremely important that this story with negotiations on the deblocking Ukrainian seaports uh, is a success story. If it is not a success story, if he is not a winner in this situation, being proud of its role in uh, you know the um, ensuring this um, uh, food uh, uh, crisis, uh, he may lose. He may lose his image of the mediator, and uh, Russia, unfortunately, can use uh, Turkey's uh, ambiguity, uncertainty in the region and their own uh, interests. What is not good to anyone, because we will have no success story with the blocking, and we will get the new wave of escalation on the southern part of Ukraine. And we do understand and we do know Putin will never refuse to get Odessa region uh, during this uh, war. And he will use any circumstances, any factors, any possibilities, also setting up and giving up their uh, regional, let's say, partner, Turkey, in um, Putin's war games. Yeah, it does sound like, you know, Turkey is acting as a proxy for uh, Putin in NATO. Thank you so much, Sergei Glebyov, for speaking with us on the program this morning. Thank you very much. Former U.S. Defense Secretary Mac Esper has said that he will take part it will take back to Washington, D.C. concerns expressed in Taiwan about the speed of arms sales to the island and the need to get greater access to weapons like portable missiles. Taiwan has previously talked of problems accessing some weapons it has on order, like the shoulder-fired Stinger anti-aircraft missiles. The missiles are in hot demand in Ukraine, where they have been keeping Russian aircraft at bay, where U.S. supplies have shrunk and producing more of the anti-aircraft weapons has faced significant hurdles due to limited manufacturing capacity. Another item on Taiwan's wish list is the Javelin, an anti-tank weapon that Taiwan already uses and it's also being used in Ukraine. Esper says Taiwan is never going to be able to match China in terms of conventional power and Taiwan should be studying how Ukraine has fought Russia using asymmetric strategies. 
I, I didn't pick up any frustration uh, other than, you know, the speed at which we conduct ourselves. And that's an issue not just for Taiwan, but for all of America's allies and partners. Our process simply is not quick enough. And uh, we need to do better in terms of approving arm cells, uh, number one. Number two is there was an expression of the need to get greater access to weapons such as the, the javelin and the stinger. And uh, number three, I think there was a concern about, you know, the supply chains and supply lines. That's an issue that my delegation and I decided to take back and to share with um, the right people in D.C. about how do we consolidate these demands being placed placed on the U.S. defense industrial base, for example, uh, to, to procure uh, Javelin anti-tank missiles, because right now our industry isn't operating at full capacity, but yet we have allies uh, from Europe wanting more of those systems, certainly our, uh, our, our friends in Ukraine, and as I learned the other day, um, Taiwan wants them as well. So we have to figure out how do we improve, give a clear demand signal to industry, and uh, how do we make sure that uh, industry can keep up with that? Because we don't have time to wait. When you look at the contest from uh, Taiwan's side, it, look, it's clear that you're never going to be able to match China in terms of conventional military power, right? Just like Ukraine is unable to match Russia in the number of jets, the number of tanks, the number of artillery pieces, etc. But nonetheless, they did an exceptional job uh, beating back the first phase of Vladimir Putin's operation, uh, where he tried to seize the country, and Kyiv in particular, and forced him into a war of attrition in the Donbass. And so I think there are parallels here that is important for Taiwan to study. I think that's why um, you know, the United States is pushing for an asymmetric approach and, and making sure that the right things are procured to support that approach. Uh, you don't do asymmetric warfare with fighter jets. Um, that, that doesn't mean it can't be part of a more comprehensive strategy, but you have to build the asymmetric capabilities first. Thank you. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko says Moscow, Kyiv, and the latter's Western allies must all agree to halt the war in Ukraine to avoid the abyss of nuclear war. Speaking of the Belarusian capital, Minsk, Mr. Lukashenko said... Let's stop, and then we will figure out how to go on living. There's no need to go further. Further lies in the abyss of nuclear war. There's no need to go there. Russian officials have said Moscow would only authorize the use of nuclear weapons in the event it was confronted with an existential threat. But concerns were raised over their possible use in Ukraine early in the war after Russian President Vladimir Putin put Russia's nuclear deterrent forces on high alert on February 27th, just three days after ordering the invasion. Mr. Lukashenko also pinned the blame for the war on the West, accusing it of seeking a conflict with Russia and provoking the ongoing bloodshed. Ukraine's central bank has devalued the Hervinem, Hriva, Hervivnia, I beg your pardon, a currency by 25% against the US dollar, to help the country cope with the growing economic impact of the war in Russia. A National Bank of Ukraine said in a statement that it set the new rate at 36.5686 to the dollar compared with the previous rate of 29.25 set at the start of Russia's invasion nearly five months ago. A bank says it acted in view of the change in fundamental characteristics of Ukraine's economy during the war and the threatening of the US dollar against other currencies. The bank's governor said the new exchange rate will become the anchor for the economy and make it more resilient at the times of uncertainty, while keeping the exchange rate fixed will enable the regulator to maintain control over inflation dynamics and support uninterrupted functioning of the financial system. We'll bring you some update uh, from Hungary's request for the purchase of more Russian gas. Just yesterday, the country's foreign minister, Peter Sriato, was said to be on his way for talks in Moscow, which may have yielded a positive outcome, as Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says Russia would consider the request to increase gas purchases from Russia. European Union member Hungary has maintained close relations with Russia, says Moscow, sent troops into Ukraine on February 24, opposing EU plans to reduce dependency on Russian oil and gas. 
And in Germany, the country's economy minister, Robert Habeck, says Berlin will tighten its gas storage targets and introduce requirements to help save gas, adding that Germany will now aim to have its gas storage facilities at 85% full by October 1st and 95% full by November 1st, up from earlier targets of 80% and 90% respectively. That move comes amid concerns that the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, which runs from Russia to Germany, will not return to delivering at full capacity. Habeck's ministry, which also introduced a new initial target of 75% of gas storage filled by September 1st, has implemented the specifications to ensure the storage facilities will be continually refilled. During a virtual news conference unveiling the measures, Habeck took aim at Moscow, accusing the Russian government of blackmailing Europe and Germany, warning that Nord Stream 1 flows could drop by below the 40% current capacity as part of Russian President Vladimir Putin's strategy. <laughs> In the meantime, the UK's foreign trade ministry has added oil and coal to its list of banned Russian imports. And it's notice to exporters. The ban on coal imports from Russia will take effect on August 10, coinciding with the start date of a Russian coal imports ban by the EU. The oil upon ban will come into force on December 31st. In addition, the previously announced ban on Russian gold imports of the UK came into force just yesterday, July 21st. The full embargo on the Russian goods will affect 80% of all UK imports from Russia, which amounted to $24.9 billion last year. But... London has not published a complete list of codes for Russian products that will be banned from entering the country. In April, the British government banned the import of silver and caviar from Russia, as well as iron and steel. Then, London extended sanctions on Russian imports and exports at the end of June, banning the supply of jet fuel, goods and technologies related to oil and, and its processing, and the British currency, the pound sterling, to Russia. The UK's latest announcement comes after the EU countries agreed on a seventh package of sanctions against Russia. As still talking about sanctions, the EU has clarified what types of transactions with Russia are still allowed amid the ever-expanding sanctions Brussels has imposed on Moscow over its offensive in Ukraine. Now, the list of exemptions include technical assistance to the Russian aviation industry under specific circumstances as well as transactions related to the food and fertilizer trade. The European Council said in a statement yesterday that technical assistance to Russia for aviation-related goods and technology will not violate any of the bloc's restrictions as long as it is needed to safeguard the technical industrial standing setting work of the International Civil Aviation Organization. EU's top diplomat, Josep Borrell, said we're extending the exemption of transactions for agricultural products and transfer of oil to third countries. The EU is doing its part to ensure we can overcome the looming global food crisis. In the meantime, the European Union has uh, approved the maintenance and alignment of a uh, package of sanctions against Russia following the exports of um, the agricultural products and oil to third countries. Uh, the package uh, extends the list of controlled items which may contribute to Russia's military and technological um, enhancements for the development or the development of its defense and security sector, thereby reinforcing export controls of dual use and advanced technology. On the other hand, though, the EU decided to extend its exemption from the prohibition to engage in transactions with certain state-owned entities regarding transactions for agricultural products and the transport of oil to third countries. The European Council stressed the bloc is committed to avoiding all measures which might lead to food insecurity around the globe. They talk so much about, you know, the business aspects of this uh, invasion of uh, Russia in uh, the invasion of Ukraine, big upon it, in Russia. And speaking of our business correspondent, Laddie Williams. Uh, to, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> of 
Well, you're you're having a great time, I'm sure. Well, you have a lot Friday. to talk about well, today. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of talking. Yeah, unfortunately, the war continues even over the weekend. Right. So about those EU sanctions that were announced, um, just um, I just mentioned them, of course, against Russia amid the Ukraine war. What do these sanctions really look like? I mean, I'm hearing, um, you know, uh, san um, sanctions on Russian gold. Um, a ban on gold, uh, non-energy exports, jewelry, right. and so on. What else are we looking at? Yeah, because we see uh, Russia, they have a, a huge deposit of gold and a massive reserve, you know, a gold reserve. And, you know, they're able to sell this gold to actually, you know, get uh, uh, income into their country and fund the war. So at the end of the day, we're seeing, you know, the U.S. the allies and its allies, talking about the EU, you know, looking for ways to squeeze out you know, most of those funds. So they're trying to, you know, stop uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the gold from being sold, you know, abroad and also an in indirect uh, sales, you know, from other uh, countries. As long as you buy it from Russia, that means you buy uh, Russian gold mm -hmm. and you come and try to sell it, you know, uh, in, in, in the global market, you'll be stopped. As long as the gold actually came from Russia, so How you know they're they know moving. It came from Russia, anyway. Exactly, they're moving deeper. You know, at this point, to make because you know the gold market is quite regulated. They know, you know, where, uh, you know, it, which gold is, uh, you know, which country, you know, yeah. is coming from. You know, they're always marked and all of that. So they're they're, make, they're taking it deeper this time because they're seeing that you know Russia is able to you know uh, most of these sanctions actually. Um, uh, evade most of these sanctions, you know, with, you know, most of these, they are, uh, the, the, most of the, uh, what they've put in place, you know, at this point. So, the, you, we see uh, Europe now trying to make sure that they shut every uh, corner, you know, so that they, every well. loophole, so they're not able to sell, you know, most of that gold and, you know, fund the war. But at the same time, they're also clarifying that, you know, uh, the, uh, talking about the aviation sector this time, there are parts that, you know, they would not be able to, you know, give Russia assistance. But they're also, you know, clarifying that they will allow, you know, when it comes to technical maintenance, to make sure that the, the airspace is safe, you know, make sure that they follow through with, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, what is needed, you know, for uh, international travel. So they're, they're making sure that they clarify most of these sanctions. You know, it doesn't involve food, because at this time we're seeing, you know, food security is a problem you know, globally. So they're making sure that they clarify the sanctions, let it not, you know, extend to food, pharmaceuticals, so third world countries can still, you know, buy, you know, medicine from Russia and, you know, not get the secondary So they're picking sanctions. and choosing. Yes, so they're picking, sanctions. yes. Because, and they will impose because on I never we've seen yeah. Putin talk about how these sanctions will impact the global economy and they don't want that to happen. You know, even though you're trying to squeeze, you know, Russia out of this war, but you still want to keep the global economy safe at this point. So that's why they have to pick and choose, you know, what mm. sanctions to uh, carry on with. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, Russia is bypassing, you know, these sanctions somehow and still thriving. But the euro right. gained uh, yesterday after the ECB meeting. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, we saw how the ECB actually raised rates for the first time about uh, 11 years. And the, the analysts have been expecting this hike because we've seen the Eurozone inflation you know, go up to about 8% in, in June. So at the end, they were seeing global uh, central bankers high rates at this time, trying to tame inflation. So Europe has uh, joined, you know, the bandwagon finally. And we saw how the uh, euro actually weakened to the dollar, actually got to parity, you know, uh, a while back. And that was because Europe wasn't taking, you know, the right actions to tackle inflation. Everybody wanted them to raise rates at this time too. You know, get that confidence, you know, back in the euro. They finally done it, and we see, we saw how the uh, euro actually gained yesterday, moved a, a little away from parity from the U.S. dollar, and also uh, Putin turning on the taps also added to that because you know we had that, those no, fears. Not a full capacity. But not a full capacity, mm -hmm. but. You know, the, the good there is they're actually getting some gas, you know, into Europe at this point. And, you know, that actually, you know, created some uh, relief, you know, for most of the uh, businesses in, in Europe at this point. And we saw how that translated to a, a stronger uh, euro at this point. But, you know, they're not out of the woods yet. They still have, you know, a lot to deal with at this point. So, 
it's a, it's a relief rally, but uh, we'll take it at this point. Yeah, and I understand the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria is advising the federal government to hold a stakeholders meeting yeah. on the Russia and Ukraine is, it invasion. Is, it what, is needed. At how this are point. they being impacted by this? Oh, they have been impacted greatly at this point because we've seen how uh, diesel, the price of diesel, has skyrocketed here in Nigeria. It's uh, over. 200 percent up you know compared to last year and you know manufacturers and uh, all this logistic company actually depend on diesel you know for their day-to-day -day businesses the industries they need diesel because obviously power supply is not what it should be you know in nigeria right now so the manufacturers are saying you know what we're, we're feeling the pinch at this point this uh, rising prices of oil uh, and gas has you know stoked um, energy costs you know in this country and right now we're seeing some of these companies actually shut down production because they cannot afford to you know keep on producing with this uh, high uh, high cost of diesel so they're telling the the government that okay you know what come let's uh, have a discussion let's see how we can you can alleviate some of these you know problems that we're going through at this point you know take out some of these taxes you know the taxes the seven percent tax on AGO at this point they're saying take that out until you know supply That's normalize normalized, you know yeah. so at the end of the day they want they want to meet they want to talk because I've already seen you know bakers actually talking about striking at this point and some of them have already started this strike and we know you know how bread how important bread is you know to <laughs> the masses even though you know some of us are not uh, too uh <laughs> but at the end of the day people like the bread you don't want to because we saw how that uh, impacted egypt you know the, the, we saw they uh, went on a massive protest when you know the, the price even of bread. Even in Sudan as well, went, the price of Sudan, bread went up. Yeah. And there were so protests. we don't we don't want to see yeah. that in you know happen in Nigeria. So the manufacturers are saying you know come let's let's talk let's see how we can you know make this a win win situation and for for all of us yeah. Hopefully they get it right. right. We're off to your favorite topic, the markets. How are they doing? Yeah, so uh, the markets are, are not looking so bad. You know, yesterday we saw the uh, U.S. market actually close in the green, but Europe was still quite mixed because you know we still have uh, some of those headwinds you know still you know impacting that zone so we saw mixed uh, market reactions yesterday but this morning we're seeing the u.s futures actually start off you know in the red this morning and it's typical of fridays you know we see most of those sell-offs you know happen on fridays but bitcoin is looking good this morning. It's in the green at $23,000, but the oil market, the oil market is red right now due to that uh, U.S. Uh, weak demand we saw. You know, for the peak driving season, it did not reflect. You know what uh, we would expect. You know, from a peak driving season. So we're seeing the prices of oil actually react to that. And uh, well, we're, we're looking out for uh, maybe a, a red close in the U.S. Uh, markets uh, today and uh, most of these other markets, but. You know, some analysts are still quite, you know, optimistic that, you know, it might actually, you know, end up well. And uh, going into next week, there's still all these economic headwinds. The markets are still volatile. So there's still cautious optimism, you know, when it comes to the markets at this point. Well, it sounds like you will be counting some money this weekend. <laughs> uh, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Andy, great speaking with you this Thank morning. You. Thanks for joining me. All right. And Thank have you. a great show later, of course. Right. Yeah. The last orders, Bell told for Bud, Carlsberg and Heineken beers in Russia in early March, but shops across Moscow are still selling off stockpiles months after the brewers said they would halt production. The continued availability of unsold stacks of Carlsberg and Heineken's flagship brands underlies the difficulty Western brands have faced in withdrawing products in response to the conflict in Ukraine. Their cans and bottles are still on sale in supermarkets and stores in the Russian capital this week. It's not clear how much inventory Russian retailers have, but for now the supplies are helping to cushion the blow of the tough sanctions which prompted the world's top brewers to turn off the taps to Russia's most popular Western beers. Carlsberg and Heineken said on March 9th they would stop production and sales of their flagship brands in Russia during an exodus of foreign companies after Moscow sent troops into Ukraine on February 24. Two days later, AB in Biev, for which runs its Russia operations in a joint venture with Turkish brewer Anadolu Ifes, said it had requested that the license for production and sale of bud in Russia be suspended. Dates printed on the bottom of the cans and bottles on sale in about half a dozen supermarkets in Moscow 
show that some production of all three beers continued in Russia after the brewer's public announcements. On March 28th, Heineken announced a decision to leave Russia, seeking an orderly transfer of its business to a new owner and expecting to book related charges of around 400 million euros while guaranteeing the salaries of at least 1,800 employees in Russia until the end of the year. Also in March, Carlsberg, the Western brewer, also well, most exposed to Russia, said it would seek a full disposal of its business, uh, Russian business, which would result in a substantial non-cash impairment charge this year. The Russian Union of Brewers last week warned of packaging and labeling problems, saying the breweries were working at limited capacity. A Russia's foreign ministry spokeswoman, Maria Zakharova, says American officials are not helping the fate of basketball star Brittany Griner and should refrain from attempts to apply political pressure on Moscow as Griner's trial on drugs charges continues in Russia. A U.S. State Department has officially classified Griner as wrongfully detained after the 31-year-old was arrested at Moscow's airport in mid-February when banned hashish vape oil cartridges were found in her luggages in her luggage, beg your pardon. Griner has pleaded guilty, and a trial continues on Tuesday at Kimki City Court just outside of Moscow. If convicted, she faces up to 10 years in jail. Moscow has consistently rejected claims that Griner is being used as a political pawn, as it says she must face Russian law and should not be granted exemptions because she's a foreigner. Ms. Zakharova reiterated that position yesterday. Also taking aim at the recent U.S. decision to add Russia to the list of countries where American citizens supposedly face the risk of being arbitrarily detained, which she described as a political illegitimate decision. Everton and Dynamo Kiev is set to meet on July 29th at Goodison Park for what is due to be football's first match for peace played in Britain by the Ukrainian side. A charity fundraiser will raise money that will directly support Ukrainian humanitarian efforts amid the ongoing Russian invasion. Dynamo Kyiv have previously participated in games in Poland, Turkey, Croatia, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, France and Belgium. Since the start of the war as part of their Match for Peace initiative. Our tickets are on general sale priced at $18 for adults and $6 for under 18s and over 65s. Supporters also have the option of adding a donation at the point of purchase. In March, Everton also contributed $299,000 to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal. Well, as we move on on the program, Ukrainian, Ukraine might have sent its smallest delegation of at least over to the World Championships, but acting Federation President Yevhen Pronin said the 22-strong team were just glad to be present in Eugene and offering up a glimmer of hope for compatriots. Yaroslav Mahuchik claimed a silver medal in the women's high jump, while Andriy Protsenko earned Ukraine's first medal of these championships with bronze in the men's high jump. Russian forces, uh, as we have been mentioning, we invaded Ukraine in February a move that saw world athletics ban athletes from Russia and Belarus from competing in international competitions. The embrace of Ukraine by the international community had been heartwarming, according to Pronin, who will return to the frontline post Eugene for three weeks before hoping to make it to Munich for the European Championships. Early on in Russia's attack of Ukraine, a rocket landed on the home of five-year-old twins, Nazar and Timur Selezhyanov, in the city of Severodonetsk in the eastern Donbass region. The boys and their mom, Olina Syriov-Nivina, uh, were blinded and suffered facial injuries. They were pulled out of the rubble and then, under tight security, made the perilous journey across Ukraine to Lviv. Their eye specialist, Dr. Natalie Priest, recognized the gravity of the condition and organized an ambulance to take them to her former professor in Lublin, Poland's leading eye surgeon, Robert Redak, who immediately, who, for immediate treatment. Now, all three have now undergone sight-saving surgery conducted by Professor Redak and his team at the Independent Public Clinic Hospital Number 1, part of the Medical University of Lublin. As well as psychological support, the family has received practical help 
from the city of Lubling, which has provided accommodation and a living allowance. Family's traumatic experience has created a path for others who have suffered eye injuries in the Ukraine war to travel to the medical university for treatment. Its rector has enabled this institution to accommodate the weekly arrival of patients, especially children, after they've been initially assessed in Ukraine. That's the program today. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubadu.